power. I was a wrestling coach, right? And uh, I was always interested in philosophy, but I was a film major. I was a philosophy minor. And where was this? So I wrestled at the University of Oklahoma. And then uh, I transferred out and I finished up my degree at Western Carolina University um, at uh, up in the mountains of North Carolina, near uh, near Asheville. You ever heard of Asheville? Yeah. Yeah, it's very nice up there. Biltmore Estate, yeah. you know, you ever heard of the Biltmore? Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so beautiful. And um, and so I was I was finishing up my philosophy minor as well. But I was one class shy, and it was my, se- my my last semester of my senior year, and I was I can't I can't focus on my film stuff, so I got to drop this class. So it's one of the biggest regrets of my life, not being able to <laughs> really have that that minor. Um, but I uh, remember some, uh, a couple of students I had as seniors, <laughs> on, like their last their last semester, you know, and they're getting an intro to philosophy class. Right. Pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. I. Uh, I regret that. Um, but so I started coaching wrestling and uh, I never thought I was going to coach. I never wanted to coach. Coaching is where you go to die. That's what I told myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm in my twenties. I think I, uh, I, I think I know what's good for me. All right. I'm 22 <laughs> years old. Um, so, uh, so I get, I get recruited. I'm working at a restaurant. I get recruited to, to help at this wrestling club or wrestling team. And the it's at a private Christian school, and uh, and I meet the 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 coach, and uh, we're talking about wrestling and stuff like that, and and then he tells me I'm also the head of the philosophy and theology department of the private Christian school, and I'm like, hmm, I like philosophy too, <laughs> and uh, he goes on to school me in everything that I don't know, and I was like, oh, I've got to I got to hang out with this guy. Like I gotta Aww. really get to know this guy because I've always thought that there was more to philosophy than just uh, Nietzsche and uh, Descartes, uh, which is what you you know you kind of get introduced to in in college. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and so from that point on, I was there. I was like, hey man, I don't want to coach, but I will come here and work out because I gotta stay in shape. I was training in mixed martial arts. And uh, I needed like a home base and ho- a home gym to train. And training with high school kids is, is great because you've got a slew of them, you know, just coming at you left and right. And you're just training and staying in shape. So after like <laughs> two weeks, uh, he was like, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. You, you can just work out with the kids. So after like two weeks, um, he just throws me a t-shirt and he's like, hey, look, put this on. Uh, tomorrow we have a wrestling match. You're a coach. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not a coach, man. I'm not... <laughs> I'm like, no, this, that's the last thing I want to do. And he's like, look, I've been watching you here for two weeks. You're a great coach. You're a great teacher. You love training the kids. Show up tomorrow at 6 p.m. We got a match. <laughs> and so, uh, so he forced that's me correct. to be a, yeah, he forced me to be a coach. Um, and he was, he was not wrong. I really enjoyed it. And I found another level or another aspect or dimension of myself in the pursuit of coaching. That's- yeah, that's lovely. And so every day, we just sat around talking about philosophy, theology, wrestling, movies, and um, and I learned, wow. I learned like kind of parapathetically. Yeah. So Love. so, and then one day he comes up to me. He was like, "Cody, you have got to watch this video about with this f- female philosopher, Esther Meeks." <laughs> And I'm like, what? <laughs> He's always throwing, you know, stuff at me and like trying to get me to, you know, open my mind up and look at things. And uh, and he was like, she is so humble. Just you, you just want to, you just want to listen to her all day. And it was the, it was the 22 minute video that you did uh, called Knowing, where you're just sitting in that chair, talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, subsidiary focal integration, right? Oh. Did I do that? Is it a recent one? Well, that's all right. It doesn't matter. No, no, it's not a recent one. <laughs> but yeah, if, if you look on YouTube, it's called Knowing, and you're just sitting there, a uh, little shorter hair. I was just watching it this morning, just kind of going back through it. 
And uh, oh. while I was working out, getting ready for this, I was like, no, I'm so nervous. I got to work out this nervous energy. Um, <laughs> but yeah. It seems so- like it would have helped you do that. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, so that's how, uh, and, and so we started just talking cause like, that's what we were doing. You know, when we're, when we're, when you're learning a sport, you can't yeah. focus on, you know, the end goal or, 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 focusing on the end goal is helpful, but there's so many things going on that if you're thinking yeah. about, you know, uh, my hand position here, my, my footstep here, yeah. y- y- you're going to get too much in your head and you're going to underperform. Called destructive analysis. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and and it's so it's so interesting as a coach because you know how to teach yourself as an athlete, and then you have athletes that don't think like you at all, and you're like, okay, mm-hmm. how do I help this kid? Like, I, I I I can't I can't think like him, and I don't think like him, but I have to understand him and kind of help him, uh, mm-hmm. kind of navigate his own thoughts. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And we had we was and since it was a private Christian school, it was very some a lot of smart kids, and you don't you should not be smart if you're going to try to wrestle. <laughs> 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 you, you don't want to think too much. In that one, <laughs> what's that? Would you like to explain that one? <laughs> well, you don't want to be thinking at all. Oh, I see. Uh, right. It, 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 it want, you want to make it all feel. Yeah. Okay. You know? And so we've got these guys who are you know just. The and they were they were twins and they were both valedictorian of their class, and they're oh. wrestling and they're just like oh, so, coach. If, if if I do this and he does that and then I do this and then he does that, then why can't I do this when he does that? <laughs> and you're like, man, you, you got to stop that. You're not gonna even get out of bed in the morning to come to practice if you keep thinking like that. You know that's great. So yeah, uh, it, it, it was a it, it's a it was such an interesting process because I didn't I didn't understand like um, someone else's learning process, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so yeah. and it's very I would think it's very evident. Uh, y- y- you know, I'm I'm comparing it just now with um, teaching in a classroom, but when you're working with somebody's body, it's you're kind of. Uh, Th- th- that that learning process is in your face mm. and you've got to figure it out in a bodily way yeah. with whoever your student happens to be. Right. You know, it, as opposed to, see, you know, if somebody were just sitting in a college classroom, it might not become evident until the test, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. And, th- and there's something that's interesting. I know you were talking about, uh, I've heard you talk about athletes before, and I love that because we just connected with that when we saw your video. Um, but uh, but there's something that like really athletic people uh, can do and not understand why they do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they make the worst coaches. It's like if Michael Jordan yeah. was a coach, his team right. would be horrible. Because he'd be like, why can't you just do what I just did? Just do what I did. Jump from the free throw line, three free throw line, and yeah. slam dunk. Like, why can't you understand this? There's a connection with the yeah. body that great athletes have that is like, it's a, it's a hard thing to, for them to explain. Yeah. Well, do you, have you heard me tell the story of, of um, well, I, I won't tell the whole story, but this, this one student I had uh, taught baseball, like he gave lessons mm-hmm. for what, $65 an hour or something like that. Yeah. And he said to me, um, I'm, I'm I'm better at teaching baseball than George Brett is. <laughs> right. Yeah. George Brett doesn't know what he himself is doing right. <laughs> and that's probably true. That's probably it's so funny he, because I just I I was listening to that seminar you gave in Dallas. That's where you were talking about it. Um and uh and he uh, uh we we would have like high level wrestlers come to our school and and give like uh seminars and teach Mm. and we kept we kept noticing that that they didn't really know what they were doing yeah but that's something yeah it's very fascinating then they would explain it in like philosophical terms kind of like you just you know it when when it, it it's never a technical you know thing it's just like a kind of coming from their soul kind of a thing and you're like 
I can't technically uh, reinterpret that for my kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I felt like uh, uh, you have to, um, w- with your uh, valedictorian twins, you do have to make an argument, but you also have to utter sentences that help somebody's body feel the right thing. Mm-hmm. And so an authoritative guide of a body, mm-hmm. like a, a music teacher, or I, I have a ballet examples and and stuff like that have they have to be able to utter a sentence that makes somebody's body uh so the the bodily subsidiary stuff come into line yeah and um and i think uh, as a writer i have to do both the argument and the feel can you explain that like with your writing process Well, I don't have a very good writing process <laughs> because I'm subsidiarily grappling, <laughs> grappling toward what it is I'm trying to say. And I, I, uh, I really do believe in editing. <laughs> but no, let me, but let me tell you what the ballet teacher said, because I yeah. just think this is so cool. So in ballet and I, you know, my girlfriend got me into it when I was 33 and what, you know, I'd never done it before. But this this lady was a great teacher, I thought. And so, um, you know how there's all this bar work, and you're supposed to stand with your your. Um, I got to move over so you can see it. But you know, your arm is kind of dangling at at a certain elegant way. But yeah. people are working on the bar; their their arm starts to go up. You know, and so she'd walk along and fix everybody's arms, as we say. But then one day she said, "Pretend." that a, a drop of water falls on your shoulder and rolls down your arm, it does not fall off at your elbow, mm. falls, falls off your middle finger. And when she said that, everybody's arms fixed, Yeah. right? And then the, the time at the very end of the bar work, you're supposed to let go of the bar and you're, you're standing up like this on your toes. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And I couldn't do it until the day she said, pretend you're sucking yourself up through a straw. Mm. And then I could do it. Yeah, that's awesome. So, see, that's that's um, uh, you know coaching body language. Yeah. You know, to to utter sentences like that that can help somebody um, body bodily feel. And obviously, in wrestling, you would be doing that a lot. But I think I think in everything, I actually think when I talk, and and uh, this is beyond me, but but I actually am inviting. Uh, people, hearers into my body to bodily indwell me because that's what my mind effectively is. So if they're going to know my thinking, they've got to be permitted to get inside me mm-hmm. and, and indwell that. And yeah. so so that means I want to t- speak or lecture in a, in a way that uh, is, is um, attuned to that tactile indwelling. And there's a level of humility. Let me just also say, uh, as you probably already realize, I'm a very excitable person. <laughs> you know, my excitement that that uh, brings people along. You know, it's like this is for everybody. Da 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 da. You know, da da da. You know, so so they there's a welcome there. Absolutely, and that's what my buddy John and I got the first time we watched your video. It's so welcoming. <laughs> Um, where a lot of philosophers can be can get very academic and kind of lose you, you know. There's there, yeah. there's there's a lack of um, a relationship there when yeah. they're speaking. Yeah. Um, but I think they need a fresh epistemology <laughs> and a fresh metaphysics. <laughs> well, and what would and yeah, I mean, obviously, you talk with these people a lot. Well, not so much as you think. I mean, I can write academic papers, but it's right. not my my uh, mission in life, I guess. And and uh, you know the the philosopher that I've uh, the philosophers. Well, no, I can't say that. Um, I, I I guess I just want to say that I'm interested in the philosophical life, and I'm interested in philosophy for the everyday in the street person, which means. Uh, at kind of an exuberance, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, about the the about reality, but then also this uh, savvy that I got from um, 
uh, a scientific discoverer talking about his process of, of knowing that I think makes sense of everything and reconnects you with what you're actually doing. So what I feel is that a um, lot of people, especially in the modern West, have been taught to inaccurately self-describe when it comes to knowing. Mm -hmm. So yay, the scientific method. Right. Right. But Polanyi, Michael Polanyi, the scientific discoverer, Hungarian uh, premier, uh, discovery was his job said, if that's how it works, no discovery would ever happen. Right. <laughs> you know, how do you get to from like zero to 60 in knowing what is the process of discovery? That's what you, you need to understand. And so then you need to accredit things that you can't put into words. It can't just be information. Yeah. Um, and so, and part of that is your, you know, your tacit powers and your skill, the fact that you resolve to commit yourself to things. I mean, there's just all this richness that goes on. Plus then this structure of subsidiary focal integration that you said you, you um, saw in that, that video and, and getting that, I mean, I feel even though I've embellished that and augmented it, and I've got a, just a, a whole rich approach, I think, to, to knowing and to reality and that whole, uh, our whole involvement with the world uh, being paradigmatically one of encounter, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, it's that, it's teaching that subsidiary focal integration is what you're already doing. Right that reconnects people with themselves. Yeah. And so what I'm doing, because you're already doing it, what I'm doing in my epistemology is like relaying the accents mm -hmm. under what you think you're doing so you can actually see what it is that you're doing. Yeah, and it's... so you know, in my class, I, you know, when I've gotten to teach uh, longing to know and then loving to know, in I had a class called Christian Understanding of Life, the third agenda in there was i called it a covenant epistemology project and people had to students had to uh, identify a knowing venture that they were going to undertake mm -hmm. and then uh they had to undertake it <laughs> and then they had to report on the covenant epistemology features of knowing right. that they saw in it and i had lots of athletes really? that did that but also yeah, seamstresses and, um, you know, political campaign runners and lovers of cities and, yeah. and uh, hunters. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> you know, the sky is the limit. I mean, I had so many, I had so many. If I, if I move to the side here, let's see. You see that? How do I do this? There, oh, yeah, see that, that blue, th uh -huh. that thing? I, why can't my, I can't get myself to move over? There it is. Okay. <laughs> So that blue thing is um, uh, uh, one of the products of uh, this project, and that is arm crochet. Uh, I'm sorry, arm knitting. Okay. So you use your arms like knitting needles. But this gal, when she did her presentation, what she did was have this circle of students knit off their own arms onto the other. And we went around the whole room, and by the time we were done, that was made. <laughs> oh wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, and all that time, she's you know up there naming all the features of knowing, you know. Wow. But see, we when when we think of knowledge as cerebral information, mm -hmm. where where is arm knitting? <laughs> right. Where are sports? You know, we still, you know, we remark if you get an intelligent wrestler or an intelligent yeah. football player, oh, we graduated from Yale or, or right. whatever, you know. Um, well, if that isn't, you know, I, I do like to watch football mm -hmm. and, and baseball and there's incredible intelligence uh, there that, that um, should not be discounted. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I it goes on in a lecture. So even if I'm talking about philosophy, mm -hmm. you've got to bodily and dwell what I'm saying to, and somehow you got to feel, you got to feel what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's something that great athletes do, which they just make it look so easy. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, well I could do that. I have all kinds of clients. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm a trainer too now. So I'm, I live out in LA and I train people. Well, that interests me too. Yeah. And it's, it's very fascinating because people who don't use their bodies when they see somebody use their body 
in a, in a very elegant, efficient way that looks easy, they're like, oh, I can do that. And then I put them in there and they're like, I, well, I, their body freaks out. They don't yeah. know what they're doing. Um, yeah. Do you, uh, I find it funny that like we don't really know how we know things, but we trust our knowing so much. Like when, when you have new students come to your class and you're like, actually, this is how you know things. Do you ever have like a student be like, no can't tell me how I know things. I know that my knowing is the proper way of knowing. You can't... Do you ever get that? I guess I would say <laughs> what I address and what is... Uh, I, and I'll never run out of a job is <laughs> most people, again, self-describe as collecting information. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's knowing. Yeah. So they don't even... And then there's, you know, huge portions of them, like the wrestling side and the film side and the da 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 da, da you know, that, that they don't, they might even think it's not knowing. Right. So, you know, they're, they're, we, we, that, um, I, you know, I call it the defective epistemic default. I call it the knowledge is information mindset. I mean, it, somehow we inhale it in the modern West. And it's part of the modernist outlook. It's it's highly uh, commodifiable mm -hmm. and um, manipulable and transferable and scalable. And, uh, you know, uh, databases have definitely got us places in, in lots of ways. But uh, to, to see that as uh, philosophically the paradigm, the problem is philosophy. Mm. Right. Do draw, drawing a, a philosophical conclusion about what knowing is, but people who love databases are bodily intimate with their databases. I mean, they they wear them subsidiarily when they're searching for patterns. That's just what we do. Right. You know, it's just the, the database needs to be seen subsidiarily, mm -hmm. just like your um, felt body sense of this hold or that hold or yeah. The, the things I confess I don't understand about wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see it. You yeah. Know, you can see the, the nuance yeah, in, in sport. What's that? Some, you know, you name those moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and you can see it, but um, I think it takes some training to see that the move is done with intentionality. So yes. in Love to you Know, I talk about virtuosity. Mm-hmm. So, so if all knowing is, you know, relying on clues to focus on a pattern or shape a pattern. So in the case of a skill, you're, you're, the pattern is the performance, right? right? And so there's all these clues. There's three sectors of clues. That would be the situation, your felt body and the authoritative guide, the three sectors of clues. But um, now, okay, what was my train of thought? Um, <laughs> you, can, you can see the, her. you can see the, uh, I think the technique and. Yes. So, so some people might be, uh, you know, have beginner's luck, mm -hmm. you know, and do it, but then, uh, they, uh, fall apart when you start to teach them. <laughs> yes. But, but what you, what lessons would be, would be learning to be intentional about those subsidiaries. Right. So that's, that's what I think of virtuoso as a piano, a piano work, but you know, you've got to learn to do scales. You've got to learn to do this and do that. And, uh, you know, if, if you've got somebody that's just been successful because of beginner's luck, that actually, that's a kind of destructive analysis that might end the, the, uh, beginner's luck, mm -hmm. but you take a risk, you take a risk. Uh, and the chant, the point is you've, you've got to learn to be intentional in singing, you know, about your diaphragm and, and your breathing and your support and your energy and not to mention the piece of music in front of you, you know, and, and then also, you know, where your focus is, is out to those for whom you perform, you know, I, here's another sports story. Um, I had a student who w was giving a presentation on this guy, Michael Polanyi. Mm -hmm. And so he had to read, you know, research that, and he was presenting it. And he said, I'm a diver. And he said, and he went on to say that he could do one of those 
pretzel dives. I don't know okay. what they're called, you know, <laughs> yeah. go around, you know, and dive yeah. into the water. Until the day his coach said to him, pull your elbow around a little farther. Oh, and then it just and fell it apart. What's that? It ruined him. Yeah. It ruined him. He could no, never do that dive again. Wow. So uh, that's, you know, there's a risk to uh, to uh, taking your eyes off the pattern and reverting to look at the, the things you're supposed to be uh, subsidiarily indwelling. But you, you need that temporary mm -hmm. destructive analysis right. in order to, to become a virtuoso. Mm -hmm. However... The pro what philosophy did was take the destructive analysis and focus on that and say that's that's the paradigm of knowing. Yes. But the point is focusing on your foot or your elbow blocks you from reality. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, you're so right. You're so right. Because like in, in any. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but in any sport. Well, I'm not a wrestler myself. <laughs> but in any sport, especially wrestling, like. The coach is so vital to uh, a kid's growth or regression, um, and mm -hmm. and simply mm -hmm. simply like you were talking about a technical uh, critique, right? Pull your elbow a little bit more, right? And that that has to happen, you know, to improve, yeah. right? And, and so you wrong. get worse. You get worse initially, yeah. and then the more you 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 know do that thing. Thinking about the elbow is not the the thing that you're focusing on all the time because the reps get in. So where now you're embodying more of the pull. So eventually it can that that extra pull in the elbow can be embodied in the the overall performance. But there is a yeah. a pulling back of a regression. Um, and yeah. then on top of that, if the coach were to say, "Hey, focus on that elbow pull," and then every time they didn't do it, what's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I saw another layer. Viola teacher of one of my daughters that did that. He he couldn't stand the mistakes, and he'd start shouting. Yeah, and then he'd say, "Stop! Let's analyze this." Mm. Well, that viola playing daughter is no longer a viola playing daughter. <laughs> she's a she's a um she likes to hit things. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like uh, you know, it's xylophones and organs and things. Yeah, yeah. I could see how that shifted <laughs> to hitting things. Yeah, that makes sense. I was going to say, um, uh, there's an element of fatigue that allows you to like learn something more. Um, oh, that's interesting. Talk yeah. about that. So when you're learning something, and especially with those valedictorian twins that we were training. We had to literally fatigue them physically so their mind would shut up. Oh. And then they started to embody it. How about that? Yeah. And so when I maybe have that's, go ahead. Maybe that's how I learn to dance. <laughs> I need fatigue. <laughs> maybe my age might count as my fatigue. <laughs> well, you know, once you get fatigued, now it's like ugh, it's so hard to think about every little thing. You're just like, I gotta get I gotta get through it. I got to do it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's not your focus. You're not focusing on the little uh, technical aspects. You're yeah. focusing on finishing, getting it done. And then when you can get your mind off of all those little things, you do it with a little bit more intention, maybe a little bit more aggression, a little bit more mm -hmm. attitude that kind of like propels you into this new level of knowing it. So I, I think fatigue and i'm i am i get fatigued in order to know <laughs> well i was going to i was going to say this when you were talking about uh your writing and you don't you're like i don't really have a writing process but i i uh i was a film major right so i i uh, my focus was screenwriting um and so there's there's a there's a moment when i'm writing that i've sat here long enough where it finally clicks and there's no way that I could have gotten there without put, putting my butt in the chair for two hours. <laughs> so patience. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I would say that. And, and then the other thing that I would say helps for writing is a deadline. Yeah. 
so I've I've uh, have I love the ocean, and um, so I have kind of a body surfing uh, approach to to writing. It's like the deadline is the the oncoming wave, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, you have to wait till you're you know it's almost about to crest, and then you rise to to the occasion. So that makes sense. So uh, I just wish I could be more. Uh, I could relax to trust that that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Letting <laughs> yeah. so, so far out. But dead, dead, I've always said to my students, deadlines are your friends. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. And then see what that does is as you get close to the deadline, you start scrabbling. It's amazing in, in academia how in the last two weeks of the semester, people produce all kinds of things. It is incredible. Mm. And people you know, get done and they say, oh, I, you know, I should have learned that earlier in the semester or da, 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 I wait, da, 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 da. Well, the fact is they produced great work in, in the uh, imminent, you know, impending um, deadline. So I would think for, you know, wrestling, a meet yeah. um, uh, is kind of like a deadline. Absolutely. Um, that was kind of one of the oh, hard, you, go ahead. I didn't watch baseball. In fact, I actually, I don't watch baseball. I love radio baseball. You know, <laughs> I okay. like to listen to it and, uh, you know, you can, but you can even in the radio, you can sense, you know, bottom of the ninth inning, you know, it's like, this is clutch time. And, and there's kind of this kind of s swelling group energy mm -hmm. that, that uh, kind of rises that to, makes sense. to that. That makes sense. Boxing matches are like that too. Really? I don't want to watch boxing. <laughs> 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 but there's an element of like, hey, I know we have 12 rounds, uh, two minute rounds. So what is that? 24 minutes of activity. You can't sprint for 24 minutes, right? So there's a little bit of like, you know, feeling each other out for the first few rounds. Managing mm -hmm. my cardiovascular uh, potential, uh, trying not to do too much activity, so I gas out in the last rounds, and then all that work mm -hmm. for you know ten rounds was pointless. I get knocked out in the eleventh or twelfth. So yeah. every everything kind of crescendos into those last couple rounds, um, and and they they call it championship rounds because for mm -hmm. for for a yeah. championship belt there are more rounds. I see. Yeah, even in like the UFC. Like mixed... What's that? <laughs> like playoffs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like in the UFC, you know, every every regular match is three rounds. But if you fight for the belt, it's five. And so a three-round a three round fight is three five-minute rounds. So that's 15 minutes. But then when you add two more, that's 25 minutes. So the... So the, wow. the, the pace of play is different mm -hmm. in those first couple yeah. of rounds. So, you know, and, and you see that some fighters uh, never win championship fights because they gas mm -hmm. in those championship rounds. Mm -hmm. Athletically, they, they are more fast twitch muscle fiber athletes where they're, they're able to sprint faster than everybody. Quicker shots, faster, stronger, but that mm -hmm. doesn't play well for you for yeah. endurance so back to endurance i mean you know you're talking about fatigue and i thought of patience but also endurance uh and and um here's another thing that's going on with fatigue is a letting go mm -hmm. right and so um did you say you you said you've read doorway to artistry right love it okay well uh the switcheroo in that book uh, for me is, you know, having spent my whole life trying to figure out how we know, uh, now I'm saying reality takes, makes the first move. Right. I mean, it's, it's implicit all the way through, but I finally gotten up my confidence to say reality moves first. And, and I know back in long, you know, I said reality's in the driver's seat when I was talking about the copperhead. Yeah. Um, but, but, uh, that means uh, a healthy way to know is, is a kind of, of, uh, letting go 
um, yeah. to, to in, invite, to, to say, okay, you do it. Yeah. Right. So something that comes from beyond, it's like, this is beyond what I am able to do. That's kind of the point at which we pray. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Is a point because God is reality, right? Yeah. So, so what we're doing when we pray is I can't do it. Help Lord. Yeah. And then he graciously comes. So it gets at this, um, uh, communion <laughs> mm -hmm. that is the paradigm. That's the paradigm of knowing. Yeah. And why knowing wouldn't be about the overture of reality. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love, I love everything that you did in that book, the way that you, uh, paralleled it to welcoming someone into your home. Mm. Um, because that's what my buddy John did to me when I started uh, coaching with him. Well, he welcomed me yeah. into his gym. He said, okay, you don't want to be a coach? Fine, come in here and work out. And he saw me for two weeks and he was like, you're a coach. <laughs> well, I see you. You know, we're doing this together. And that's, like, that's true. I mean, he, he was looking at you. Yeah. And he put a word on it and said, look, you're a coach. <laughs> <laughs> do it. <laughs> um, when you when you started to conceptualize this idea for a book about the artistic uh, hmm. expression, right? Creativity. Um, was it, did you have somebody in mind? I mean, I know you've talked, you've spoken about your grandkid, grandkids and, hmm. and your daughter, your daughters. Yeah. Um, because when, I guess. You I, know what I had in mind, I would say, uh, and, and this is actually a, a possibly a series oh, called okay. Doorways. And that was my editor's idea. Yeah. And because my point in all those covenant epistemology projects that I made the students do is I, I'm here to tell you, try it out. This is my challenge. This is how knowing works in any field. Yeah. Which I it is. And so in a way, me starting this doorway series is me finally, the teacher finally doing a covenant epistemology project. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so you know, the next book's uh, liable to be in business. Okay. You know? Yeah. So entrepreneurship, design, thinking, mm -hmm. that, you know, that kind of thing. That And I've been interested in business ever since my first book came out and a business consultant said to me, there's a business seminar in this book, you know? So, mm -hmm. so I'm intrigued. And I, and like, because in the modern West, I think our misdescription of knowing, uh, actually blocks the savvy that connects us with reality. Right. So just like you had to <laughs> anesthetize your twins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it also, it also, it could be that if you if you said to them, "All right, I'll take you on philosophically. This is how knowing works: subsidiary focal integration. Mm -hmm. It might heal them too." True. And yeah. and so I think my understanding in business now, and this is a you know a kind of a baby idea. I've been blessed uh, to uh, talk every six weeks with a very enthusiastic, really good design thinker in New Zealand. All right. <laughs> Who's interested in my work because he thinks I get it. <laughs> but but uh, what happens is we tend to think in modernity, it's about collecting and comprehending, or it's about something totally random and uh, intuitive, you right. know? And if you've got that either or, both of those are going to self-destruct in business. And you need something that looks more like skilled knowing all our subsidiary focal integration. But who teaches that? I mean, I've never heard about the subsidiary from any single other philosopher besides Michael Polanyi. Yeah. And and to me, it's it's, you know, in bike riding, how can you keep your balance on a bike if you don't have a felt body sense of keeping your balance you know well that's subsidiary yeah. and but it's very uh uh you're very aware of it as a in a subsidiary way it's 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 felt you couldn't put words on it 
if you think if you overthink it it's going to go away you're going to fall off the bike i mean there all that but you that's the anchor of your performance yeah you know so even in, in that performance you've got this from to artful see i think all knowing is artful too mm -hmm. so when so when it comes to artistry i think um it actually you know, I think the artistic act and the act of coming to know are effectively the same thing. They're both subsidiary focal integration. Yeah. So, so, um, I, you know, I've been selling that for as long as I, I knew of Polanyi's approach to, to knowing. Right. So, and I'm sure, don't you feel some kinship somehow in your body between your wrestling and your film? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when, when my brother and I are writing, he, he writes Southern Gothic. Um, <laughs> you've heard that, of that. I, I think that's what you do in the Asheville area, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flannery, I mean, <laughs> Flannery O'Connor ask. Yeah. Um, right. Right. And, uh, there's such, there's such a uh, embodiment in that writing. Um, mm. you know, like Parker's you back. Kind of wear south right i mean don't you have to you really have to feel the south yeah you do yeah it's a thing it is and uh that's what all the the great southern gothic writers kind of perpetuate um, yeah this tacit do you know, knowledge so this name down and and see if you or your brother know pete candler pete candler I, i've never heard of him oh well you need to okay so let's see uh, I'm I'm gonna Google him right now. He he endorsed uh, Doorway to Artistry. Oh wow! And he's a, a fellow uh, Fujimura Institute scholar with me. That's how I know him. But he lives in Asheville. Pete Candler, come on, go. So he's got a website, Pete Candler. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, a deeper. South. So he's an author of this thing called A Deeper South, which I think is a great title. Yeah. And he's a candler. He's a candler. Do you recognize that name? No, I don't. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Okay. And, right. you know, famous judges and things in Atlanta. I mean, it's an Atlanta, you know, kind of aristocracy sort of a thing. So wow. he's got some ghosts in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess that, that comes with the territory, right? So um, follow him up. I will. A deeper cell. That's a that's a website too. He gives talks. He's um, he's the kind that goes on the road with an old camera and takes pictures and put makes picture books too. Yeah, I see one and, of his new books, "The Road to Unforgetting." Yeah, how about that? Uh huh. So, uh, like I said, he endorsed um, "Doorway to Artistry," which. You know, I consider quite an honor that he yeah. did. But anyway, yeah. it seems like you guys need to know each other. Your brother needs to know Pete Candler. So. Yeah, that would be cool. I'll, I will definitely tell him about him. Um, but uh, but you know, I wanted to, I wanted to mention something to you when when I teach clients how to perform a movement as a trainer, mm. not a wrestling coach. That obviously something, but um, but as a trainer. Um, I teach them a movement, right? There's technicality to it. There's positioning, um, you know, muscular activation. And uh, I, I have to bring to the awareness or to their awareness things about their body and the lack of their connection to it. <laughs> and, it and it can irritate them. Yes. <laughs> this is my yes. body. I know. Don't tell me I don't know my body. I know. And, it, and it's... And it, the but, that and longing to know the role of authoritative guides and knowing that you even you have to submit to the authoritative guide naming your body to you yeah and, and that can be and i've got some clients that are like oh wow thank you so much i didn't even know i had a glute muscle i haven't felt <laughs> i haven't felt that in two decades you know uh but and then some people are like i i don't i don't like this i i don't like the fact that yeah. i haven't used it in two two decades you know yeah. like you shouldn't let me well, know I about this the adverse impact of modernity that that Descartes and company de disconnected us from our bodies. So our bodies become objects as opposed to subjects. Yeah. And and so we don't feel our body. Yeah. I, I think I can name some 
bad stuff in my life I've done because I was disconnected from my body. Yeah, I get that for sure. And and that's kind of like my business, you know. It, like you said, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a job. Uh, I wouldn't have a job if, pe- if people like were having a really good relationship with their body. You <laughs> right, but, but because of modernity, you're never going to run out of a job. <laughs> right, and my clients yeah. are always like, "Oh man, I just I don't know why I can't do this workout when you're not here." And I'm like, "If you could, I wouldn't pay rent." Okay, so <laughs> it's kind of good that you can't. Physical therapist. <laughs> yeah, but there's something that happens. Go ahead. Size printouts, you know, they're all down there in the drawer, but yeah, it, it, you brought up something that I try to tell all my clients. Like I come over, I train a lot of people at their house. They've got their own gym sometimes. And, um, we do strength training. We do cardiovascular training. Um, and some people, it, it becomes more of a chore when you don't have something you're training for. Hmm such yeah. as ballet. If you're just like training your piriformis and stretching your piriformis just to stretch yeah, it so it doesn't yeah. hurt, it's like, Which ugh. is why I, yeah. Right. But if you have an activity, a hobby, a sport to train for, then you'll do it. Yeah. Because when you yeah. can't, like a lot of people, you know, I live out in LA, we've got beaches, we got mountains right beside each other, which is the strangest thing, you know? And it's- Lovely. <laughs> and uh, and so people like to hike, but when you start hiking and you can't make it to the top of the mountain anymore because you've got too much foot pain or too much glute knee pain yeah. or something like that. My knees, knees, yeah. Right. So then it becomes a real issue, and then you're like, okay, that's what we're training for. We're training yeah. for when your grandkids come into town and you want to go on a hike with them to the Hollywood sign, you can make it. Yeah. Up there. Yeah, that's lovely. You know? Well, that's, you see, that's so interesting connected to subsidiary focal integration, because if you don't have that vision, mm-hmm. then uh, it's effectively destructive analysis. Yeah. So f- in a way, physical therapy would be like destructive analysis. So, so, but if you have this sense of, okay, I want to be able to make it to the top of that mountain. Right. Right. Um that, then that's actually what makes the subsidiaries sing. I think that, you know, that, um, so the way that comes to expression and doorway to artistry is the primacy of the real, mm-hmm. you know? So, so when you kind of go from talking about knowing how we know to talking about reality, what I'm doing in doorway to artistry is, is saying, look, um, let's give a primacy to things, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so, you know, I, the, the, um, the pedestal dish, you know, that, that I talk about, um, it's, it's clay, it's Portuguese clay, you know, is, is profoundly meaningful because it's a pedestal dish Mm -hmm. and actually philosophically, you can't make sense of the parts without the whole. Right. And so that's that primacy of things uh, directly challenges modernity too, because modernity has been reductivist to yeah. reduce to the bits, but there's no sense. You can't make sense of the bits without the pattern, yeah. you know, you just can't. And so to give a primacy to that. So, so, um, you know, your, your, uh, training that would be just for, uh, you know, making a happy piriformis, yeah. <laughs> You know, um, uh, is kind of like a, a reverting to focus on what uh, ought to be subsidiary, mm-hmm. but it's a virtuosity too. I mean, that's the other thing about training is uh, you revert, but then what what you're doing too is is developing not only strength but also artistry, right? You know, that uh, moves you toward the goal. Yeah. And, and click, and what were you going to say? I was going to say, do, are you near, um, Monaco? Monaco? No, that's near Pasadena. No, that's not the right word. What's that beach up there? Malibu. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Monaco. Yeah. That's a I, nice place too. <laughs> <laughs> I have a student that moved to, to the LA area. Okay. And 
Uh, you could find him online. Right. I think you guys might like each other. Nice. Um, his name is Chris Carter, and he's a photographer. Mm -hmm. And he has, uh, um, if like his life has been changed by um, taking up strength training and running. And oh stuff. wow, that's awesome! So, um, so Chris Carter, he's on Instagram. Okay, and Does you he, can he obviously him follows you. Right. Dr. Meek. <laughs> I was I was talking with Dr. Meek. Yeah. <laughs> she said I yeah. Awesome. But he takes ama amazing photos. I I bought one. Just it's beautiful and a lot of it is seaside, oh, you yeah. know. Yeah. And a lot he does a lot with um athletes. I mean, he's got a whole series of um skateboarders. Oh, that's great. And stuff. But anyway, nice. Chris Carter. Cool. I commend him to you. I'll check him out. Um, but what you were talking about, um, I, I, what I was thinking, um, so like in that example of like trying to be able to hike the mountain, right? Hike up to the Hollywood sign, right? When you, when we revert back to training, right? And we want to strengthen our glutes, you know, for mm -hmm. the hike. Uh, yeah. When we get back on the mountain and we're walking, we're able to feel the glute more. And so that changes the way that we're walking up the mountain. Um, and That's it, and interesting. It, and yeah, and, and it creates it creates a, uh, a new perspective on how to walk a mountain. So give, it another, give me another sentence about that. Well, uh, so a lot of people, and maybe this is too technical when, when it comes to, uh, to uh, the body, but a lot of people are quad dominant right and and especially when we sit all day in a chair at our office or doing a podcast with a random person from los angeles yeah i wondered about that <laughs> yeah. so what happens is our glute muscles kind of shut off because we're not using them we're sitting on them mm -hmm. right so a lot of my clients who work all day have piriformis issues because they're sitting yeah. on those piriformises <laughs> right I your client Please. Yeah. And so we have to strengthen we have to strengthen those muscles because when those shut off, your inner thighs and your quads, the the muscles on the top of your legs become the active muscles. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you squat down instead of your glutes turning on, which they would normally do, because they're so used to being shut off and they're weak, they don't mm -hmm. they don't activate, right? So when you walk a mountain without any glute training, your your knees are going to hurt. Your inner thighs are going to be tight. Your quads are going to be oh, tight. Cody, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I have to do with my clients is I have to release all that tension. We have to roll out the quads, stretch oh, the inner man. thighs, and then strengthen the glutes. You know, we'll do some band work, put the bands around the knees, do some glute bridges, yeah. strengthen the glutes, and then do squats with that band on. So that our glutes oh. are, our glutes are actually working when we're squatting. Bless your heart. <laughs> it's fun. I enjoy it. I'm. I know. I'm. I'm just feeling a little envious at the moment. Oh well, you because know what? You can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know what? When you do that, and then you start feeling your glutes again, you're. It's very empowering. Because your glutes are the biggest muscle in your body. And so when you start walking up a hill and you're actually using that big muscle, you're like, oh, I can do this for a while now. I've conditioned this big muscle. But before it was just, well, I wasn't even using it, you know? Yeah. So there's a, a, there's a like an empowerment there of climbing yeah, the mountain. Yeah, that's, like that's beautiful. I like it. Yeah. Um. So and then there's something else. I you know I'll, I'll you know I'll, I I was training a director the other day and and uh, you ever heard of a Turkish get up? Get up. Get up. Okay. No. Okay. You lay on your back and you hold a kettlebell above your head. Oh, gee. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> and then you just stand up. But there's like okay. I think there's like six or eight different steps to the movement. So you come up to the elbow, come up to the hand, come up to the hip, mm. the knee, stuff like that. Mm. 
and you continue wow. right and you continually improve increase the weight that you're holding over your head and as oh, you go th- as you go through all these movement angles your core is activated in different ways yeah. right and you're you stable- write that <laughs> and you're stabilizing your shoulder you're creating isometric isometric strength in your back and your shoulder and mm-hmm. um wow. so you know when i teach that i'll teach it at a very light weight right and then and then i'll wait for my client to be like this is this is easy what are we doing and i'm like good okay good i'm glad <laughs> it's easy now okay so instead of doing 3 we're going to do 15 now tell me tell me how it feels on 15 compared to 1 cuz you're going to know that movement completely different on rep 15 because certain muscles are going to be fatigued that you didn't even think you were using. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, oh, okay. And so when we got to 15, instead of thinking about his core, he was thinking about his shoulder. Like his short, his shoulder's on fire just holding that kettlebell up. And when that happens, you've got to approach that movement differently. You know? Uh, but anyways, that, that you get to learn that movement in a different way once the fatigue sets in. You know, kind of like ultra runners. Thing too. So, you know, again, back to uh, I get fatigued in order to know. In fatigue, uh, uh, your shoulder muscle would be crying out. Right. Yeah, literally. And, and you would uh, have to kind of step aside from your path to attend to it. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to watch. And then you know back back to those valedictorian twins. Um they wrestled the best once they got tired. They just had to get Because they were taking their body more seriously. Yeah. And and listening listening. Yeah, and there's stakes. Body. There's stakes now. I'm tired. S T E A K S. <laughs> yeah, that's my it's the southern way of saying steaks. <laughs> they sound delicious, <laughs> but they're dead meat. <laughs> right? Yeah. There you go. But yeah, so like once that once the steaks kind of get get risen or rise. Um, oh, S T A K E S. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> my bad. I thought we were on the same page with that joke. but but yeah once the stakes rise and there's there's like like you feel that like okay i i have to make sure i'm dialed in your thoughts simplify like if you ask like uh anybody who does like an endurance sport you're like what are you thinking like how did you run a hundred miles and it usually comes down to a word or like a three word phrase I don't stop. You know, it's not like, well, I had to, my, my knee was, had to rise up at a 34 degree angle and no, you know, the mind can't, you just can't put energy into that. It has to simplify to, to what the, the goal is, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I loved training those, those kids because it was so fascinating to watch Mm. because I'm the opposite. Like, I was in my body, you know, when I was wrestling, I could feel it. Um, I was obviously more athletic, so that helps, <laughs> right? Just automatically synced up with my body where I don't have to think about it as much. Um, and they were pushing against their natural talents, which is very intellectual pursuits, you know. Um, yeah. but And all- I think it's modern, too. I remember one student I had in seminary who uh, – during the course of of the course you know he came out he came to class one day and his eyes were big and he said i worked out differently yesterday Mm. and and he said i i stopped fighting my body wow and i started to work with it that's huge it's what you're saying i think right yeah absolutely Modernity has put us in opposition mm-hmm. against the things that are not knowledge. Right. Right. 
Yeah. 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 Mind. Boo. Body. Yeah. Yay. Uh, facts. Boo. Feelings or emotions or right. kind of that that thing. I do that at the beginning of loving to know. Yeah. And, the, and there's. And, and so, go ahead. So the, uh, the dynamic of modernity is mastery. Mm. Right. It's 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 not this perichoretic dance like communion. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and there's something about wrestling or combat sports like jujitsu, boxing, kickboxing, where you sit on the side of the mat and you're like, you know, if I if I grabbed him here and uh, flipped him over here, then I could pin him, right? Yeah. All right. Now go do it. <laughs> you you can't you can't just think about it, right? You got to go yeah. out there and see if those thoughts match up with the reality of another partner. You know, yeah. and uh, a person, yeah. uh, a person that is uh, unwilling to be moved, <laughs> right? And so, like in 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 combat sports, it's always all right. Go do it. You know, there's there's not that much talking, but when you can you can put that in and, and like create a dialogue there and like kind of philosophize about movements. Those people, you know, especially if that's your coach. Like what a what a great setup as an athlete to have a coach willing to entertain you know thoughts and ideas instead of just go do it go go train all body all body yeah yeah which can be body as object too yes yeah yeah that's right well I I've always wanted to do an athletics seminar <laughs> okay. So like you and I could do it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would love my buddy John. He uh he did his dissertation I guess the, he got his doctorate I think maybe 3 or 3 years ago. Something like that. And uh that's all we talk about is, you know, uh somehow we we relate philosophy to wrestling. <laughs> I don't know how we do it. <laughs> but it's always brought back to wrestling. Oh, that's lovely. So with my mom, I tell her, you know, my mom, uh, she's in her 60s, and um, she loves to garden. Mm. She's a nurse, but she loves to garden, and that's her physical exercise. Mm. Now, she's got some, some physical issues going on, and I'm, you know, I told her, hey, you got to do this, got to, you know, do these stretches, do this strengthening exercise, and it only, it only gets done once her physical ailments uh, take away her gardening time. Ah. And so I have to hold that above her head and be like, hey, now. <laughs> Garden out there, it needs you. <laughs> yes, it does. Yep. That's lovely. I well, I, I understand all that. I, you know, especially, uh, you know, with my grandchildren three blocks away down down there, but also my garden. Yeah, yeah. you're right. I wanted to uh, talk to you about the the book um, Doorway to Artistry because you know I've you know, I've got a few books I read when I want to get motivated or inspired to to create something. Um, John Gardner, you ever heard of John Gardner? He's a Southern writer. No, I have a friend, John Gardner, but that's <laughs> not he. But he's got a book on writing that kind of my brother and I kind of go back to every once in a while when you want to get re-motivated to like start a new story and, you know, get into that character. What's that? It's called, I'm drawing a blank right now. Here we go. John Gardner. He actually wrote a book called Grendel, which is a, uh, um. That's a bad guy. Right. In, in uh, uh, Beowulf. Or I think. In Beowulf. Oh, Beowulf. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, it, it's it's a really good. It's from Grendel's perspective. Um, mm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, what is it? Well, you'll think of it. Yeah, but anyways, so we go back to that. But this is now my my book that I go to for ah. for inspiration, simply because it it reminds me that my relationship with God is reciprocal. There's an overture, like you said, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like my relationship with God is my relationship with creativity in a way. Um, 
I can uh, I can trust it and kind of uh, not not fo- not trust myself as much, right? I guess or not not put the focus on on me, but on the relationship. Hmm. If that makes sense, I think so. So uh, your your sense of your creativity it uh falls in line with how the book is describing it so that you can see your creative process as response to the overture of reality yes and something else i want to say about it um it's almost like the way that you write uh there's so many the way that we wrote, the way that I write the way that you wrote doorway to artistry it's like as okay. you write it and I'm reading it I'm like yeah of course yeah oh good yeah shoo right yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the the whole time I'm reading I'm like yes right I forgot that oh yeah okay oh I'm so happy that's and, wonderful to know oh yeah yeah I love it I've told I, so many people about you know, it I haven't had that many many people talk to me about what it was like to read the book. And so I I am still in the stage of not a whole lot of confidence of about the the viability of the endeavor. So thank you. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'll call you up every once in a while and be like, "Hey, look, I love the book. Yeah. It's great." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got re-inspired today. Uh, Good. <laughs> but I think I think, you know, because, you know, I've I've sought out a lot of, you know, metaphysical understanding about reality. And so when I when I hear it in the in your words in such a welcoming and like uh non-academic way, I'm like, "Dang, this is so great." And every time I read it, I want to give okay. it to a younger creative person. Oh, neat. That's great. Because yeah, right but- now, especially in Hollywood, uh there's this um especially out here in LA, there's a uh, there's a uh, a lack of connection with God, <laughs> and and it kind of you know I've gotten to know like I'm from North Carolina. I was raised uh, a Christian. Um, I have two parents who who really showed me what it was to be a Christian. Um, and then I move out here to L.A. and people don't really know what a Christian is. They've got a caricature in their mind uh, of what a Christian is, and they've got a caricature of what they think God is. And um, when you kind of come up against that, and you're like, and they're like, "Hold on, you're a Christian? Why are you so nice?" And you're like, "Hold on, what am I missing? What am I missing? What happened to you? <laughs> what happened to you? Who who's been lying to you?" Uh, and uh, and this book, it seems to me, is something that I would give like a young a young creative artist out here in this world that is like rejecting uh, the concept of God that you and I re- receive every day, or at least try to receive every day. Fantastic! Praise God! I you know I really um I don't talk about God a lot in the book because mm-hmm. that's the kind of person I want to read reach. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh heal. <laughs> right. In, in a way that then uh opens them to the reality of God. Yeah. I, I don't see how this book wouldn't do that. I think it really does do that. Cuz I mean every when I read it, that's what I want to give it to. Like I train young young people out here and um a couple of them are creative. And I want them yeah. to, hey, read this, chew on it. Chew on yeah. this. Well, and, and let me ask you this too. I feel, I really do feel, because it's kind of my shtick, <laughs> that artists and creatives are damaged yeah. by modernity. Mm-hmm. And I, I would say, uh, and so I want to ask, I guess, Lots of artistry is destructive. Yeah. And and uh it's like you can't be artistic if you're not wretched. Yeah. 
And um, that can't that can't be. <laughs> Just, I don't I don't find I don't know where the joy is there. Yeah. Yeah. Joy, joy is way better for artistry. I would I would say. Yeah. Is that is that the case? <laughs> yeah. Love of the real. I mean, yes. here's what we were made for. Yes. We were made to love the real. Yes. And the real is things and and the God who says yes to them. You know, you know, it's just, Right. That's like one big package beyond me. Uh, well, I'm a thing too, but, but, um, and, and we're f in my metaphysics of childhood, you right. know, that, that that's really our default as, as a baby, mm -hmm. you know, and, and our kind of our natural exuberance and affirmation, you know, the soul's fundamental relation to the world is affirmation and joy and being. That's the line I keep quoting in, in uh, doorway to artistry that, and that exuberant has exuberance has got to be a creatively productive that this even sounds like Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it, it's fascinating that a lot of artists don't seek out any philosophical growth or education. Well, and they distrust reality like yeah. everybody else in modernity, right? Right. So, so our artistry would be all stuck in here, mm -hmm. right? And and um, not a communion with the real, even though, in uh, under their very gaze, they are loving their materials. That right. that's what it just it just seems to me. You know, this the that a, a, a creative just loves the feel of what they're working with. Yeah. You know, and maybe it doesn't work quite that way, but. I mean, you you probably love you know cutting and splicing and you know framing and shots and yeah. you know moving the camera and you know all that stuff is the materials I would guess of of film and it's utterly delightful. Yeah, and and then like reorienting yourself towards viewing those things as gift. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and the. Sensual, you know, the overture of reality in the first place mm -hmm. is gracious gift. You know that you that you know something catches your 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 th attention, your notice. That's reality speaking to you, right? You know, I have a, a young film guy, former student who's helped me make some of my reels and stuff. My beloved magical, I call him Andrew Calvetti, and um, he likes abandoned places. Mm. And and to him they're they're almost holy spaces. And so, you know, when he films things, it's almost like he's opening this precious uh, place <laughs> to people who couldn't climb up those rocks and into that hole and down in that dripping whatever you know. Right. Or <laughs> you, you know, so so um, he's motivated by that love. That's fascinating. Yeah, I um. You know, I I train creatives and uh, and uh, how I'll, do you train them? What's that? What What do you do to train them? Uh, just strength and conditioning. You know, body weight movements. Creative. Oh, uh, I oh I see what you're saying. Oh. The train was not creative, but they happen to be creatives. Right. And you right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and and they love you know the creative process and you know artistry. Uh. But when I bring up God, we're talking about two different things. Mm -hmm. And it's and I'm like, oh wow, oh it, there, there's there's been no uh, search for, you know, the metaphysical explanation of God. Right? Mm -hmm. Um like I was I was talking to, to to somebody the other day and you know, they're like, Well, I don't I don't believe in God and I'm like, oh, well, can you tell me what that is? And they're like that. You know, I can't believe somebody's like in the sky telling you, the spaghetti monster in the sky thing. And I'm like, oh, you're too smart for that, dude. You're too smart. <laughs> you're way too smart for that. And then we started talking about the transcendentals, the good, the true, the beautiful, and being itself. And he was like, I've never heard this. And I'm like, dude, this this is fun. This stuff is fun because then it's going to inform all these creative pursuits that you're doing. That's beautiful. 
I and, like that, Cody. And I didn't, you know, and and I guess you don't realize like when you're when you seek something like like when I'm training somebody in mixed martial arts, like how to fight. Their ver their idea, their definition of a fight is something primal. Because they don't do it. They don't go to the gym every day and, and do it for two hours with their buddies. <laughs> Which is a <laughs> strange thing to think about. But that's what you do. When you compete in a fight, that's what you do. You you fight every day. And you find the joy in it and you have a relationship with it. And it, it has nothing to do with anything primal at all. It's all technical. It's all, you know, uh, you know, a lot of training. Art. Yeah, it's, it's an art. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I did, you know, I think one of the things that I'm uh, really, I guess, discovering and like journeying with is this phrase I heard, um, this quote, it's like, you will never understand, if, if you don't understand the heart of words, you'll never understand the heart of man. Hmm. And I don't know how you take that, but for me, I kind of take that as like, there is an emotional attachment to a word that I might not have that you have. Like when I say mm -hmm. fight, what do you feel? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Not what do you know, but what do you feel when I say fight? Because when I say when I say fight to me, I'm like, okay, all right, keep my distance. Technically I'm gonna be out of position here. But to someone who never fights, it's like I gotta run away. Or or, or something. There's an emotional thing that like defines it for them. Um and uh I think I'm really when I teach I talk about a philosopher's yay words and boo words. <laughs> okay. Well, it, yeah. What do you mean by that? So, so when Nietzsche says life, he's happy. Mm. Right. Right. Or when, when, uh, Wendell Berry says abstract, that's a boo word. Mm. Okay. <laughs> right. You know, just like that, just to help, you got to have the, the feelings with it so that you, you get, okay being a de death you know decadent is a bad thing decay for nature life's right. good thing you know yay words and boo words so so um in doorway to artistry my my list of wendell berry's boo words right and yay words i are in there in, in a chart you know okay forgot about that spot um that's all right but you know, to, to your point it's yeah. to your point yeah yeah um well, I love that you just said effectively what I'm trying to do in doorway to artistry. That that um, uh, we in a I, I, I guess what I'm trying to do with metaphysics is restore us to astonishment at existence. Yeah, and you know, I, as a Christian believer, I I think we need a. a uh, kind of a stronger doctrine of creation that way. I mean, the most astounding thing about you is you're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, yeah. you exist, <laughs> you know, because you might not be. Yeah. And, and and so then I think, as you're right, that idea of, of um, everyday jewels of the right. real, you know, the things that you know, glinting their truth, goodness, and beauty, you know, that that should be stunning. And and I have felt like if if you can kind of get your your doctrine of things right, it 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 has to open up. It's like where does this come from? Yeah. If something might not exist, aren't you interested in why it does? Right. <laughs> you know, and and isn't that it's 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 the the uh, splendor, uh, uh, the overflowing splendor that just seems to say, okay, I need to start to think this is Christmas morning. Yeah, you know, I love this that. Is, this is for you. This is for you. So who's out there? <laughs> right. Yeah. Showering me with gifts, you know. So I, you know, I've I've tried to I do feel like the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of incarnation uh approves or accredits us honoring things in themselves. Mm -hmm. And loving them just cut, whether they're they're uh, natural or uh, human made. I mean, that's why I use the pedestal dish. You know, it, um, it's a thing, and and uh, so it's um, we can honor it and rejoice in it and love it. And then as we do that, then there's kind of like this sense of the beyond, right? You know, 
of love and gift. It's like when, you know, uh, lots of people say, okay, we got to say thank you. At come Thanksgiving, we got to say thank you. Well, who do we say thank you to? Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of begs the larger question. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So if reality is gift, who is the giver, you know? Exactly. And what would he have to be like for me to honor things? Mm -hmm. And see, I think that uh, we tend to be so subpar with regard to things that it, um, uh, it's it's uh, it's really like Michael Hanby says it's the the primacy of things uh, is distinctively at home in the Christian in, in in Christianity and the Greeks didn't have a, a sophisticated enough account of God so that he could be radically transcendent enough that things could be free in, in their ownness and in their particularity. Mm -hmm. And the doctrine of the incarnation kind of also helps us to, to see the kind of the honor that things standing on their own have just because God is able, like God being the best God there is, naturally can't help himself but overflow in in these good things he get he kind of gives it away to things to be there in their ownness and for us to delight in them and and he's just but he but he has to be there mm -hmm. you know i try to say that in that little section on on religion right but not but you know i i think christians well meant uh but lot you know lots of us having not done the incredible philosophical work that some people like aquinas and others have done uh, even a, a, about their own faith they tend to think it sounds sacrilegious mm -hmm. or or idolatrous or um materialistic and and it's more spiritual sounding to to turn away from things because things are blocking you know the true reality and i think a lot lots of believers in the arts tend to do that too mm -hmm. so in other that'd words, be more of a gnostic approach yeah 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 but but do you think that we're doing it unconsciously i think it's well meant okay uh, um and you know how many things do you have to get right about god for him to love you right none <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, yeah. uh, that's, you know, even if you had the Bible memorized, <laughs> how much would you really know about God? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, you, you know what it's like to know someone who loves Jesus and, and, uh, that's a reality that he gives. And if they can't, if they are, they're not doing right by, you know, their, china blue and white pedestal dish right. <laughs> you know uh, uh, it, it, that's be that's whatever however i what i think is the fact that we love blue and white pedestal dishes bears witness to god's to the doctrine of creation mm -hmm. which you know can be says it is the doctrine of god you know god is continually overflowing mm -hmm. in in, you know this um bringing to be to be of things and and it is astounding so it, with an artist i think if you know artists are lovers of materials and then they develop them i mean that's that's what it is to be an artist and you know um if they could if if, if uh and anybody in a creative process you know making an omelet or mm -hmm. or gardening or you know whatever it is film you know it, it, just that process is bearing witness mm. to this larger way things are yeah you know and so uh, that's why i um i probably referenced this but it, you know um there's a six minute video of mako fujimura talking about his painting golden sea mm -hmm. and there's a shot of him in the the shop in japan from which he buys the pul pulverized minerals mm -hmm. and he's grinning like a kid in a candy shop and he's you know lovingly holding the bottles you right. know? <laughs> i mean okay he paints with precious minerals but but the fact is you know there's this utter delight that's expressed in that film yeah in this material 
Now that, that bears witness. That's kind of an honest, authentic communion with the real. Yeah. Does it ever fascinate you uh, at the creative expression of people who consider themselves atheists? Yeah, it kind of bears witness against them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's interesting to me because I know a lot of them out here. And yeah. I'm like, dude, what you're doing is so like relating with reality. That's right. Look at what you're doing. Yeah. Well, and that's my job, you know. That's why I say it's it's philosophical therapy. Yeah. Is say, you know what? Uh, you're you've been taught to misdescribe. Right. What's actually going on when you know? Yeah, and and it's almost like um, taught to misdescribe because to describe the way you're talking about is unintellectual. Or. Um, yeah, it's childlike. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Sorry, <laughs> I represent that. Okay, all right. Right, I embody it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I seek it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's talk about the physics of childhood. <laughs> exactly. I feel like when I have a kid, there's so much about my life that I'm going to understand more. Yeah, it's wonderful to have a kid it's also it's in some ways more wonderful to be a grandparent but you kind of have to go through the first one <laughs> right. first <laughs> darn it okay all right i was thinking i was gonna fast track that one oh, so what is what is that process of uh what is the difference in knowing yourself with a with your own child and then with a grandchild well if the question is about child likeness i i have to you know confess uh i again i think i said this already i'm a very excitable person i i could bottle excitement and sell it you know uh, i just and and i i the the times i've done life poorly mm. is when i've tried to <laughs> have an adult stereotype <laughs> it just it's it's so fake to who i am yeah. you know <laughs> Well, so, uh, do you know that cartoon called Up? Yeah, yeah, so good. <laughs> all right, somebody likened me to the dog in that. So that's <laughs> <where I'll... laughs> that's, hey, that's that's a... I, I mean, I just can't help it. I love that dog. You know, and, you know, I tried, I've, I've tried to be an adult, but, you know, it just, it just doesn't work. Well, well, what happens with, um grandparenting yeah. is it's almost like you're given permission to be childlike mm. because uh your job you know when you're pa when you're a parent you're surviving right and the uh, though i am writing a book right now on the mother's smile and it, how it forms us philosophically just coming out of doorway to artistry yeah uh my my daughter and son-in-law are uh they are doing the best they can, but it is a scramble. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just, it's a scramble. Whereas I, you know, sit in my happy ivory tower and, <laughs> you know, my grandchildren <laughs> come over for two hours and I send them home, but I can, I can talk to them. I can see them. I could, my job is to play with them. Right. Yeah. But it what, uh, you know, when I was a mom, I was too, I was too overwrought. <laughs> right. So, you know, your your job as parents is to kind of get everybody through. Right. And, you know, there's plenty there's plenty of intimacy with parents uh as, as children. My my daughter just last Thursday night had to go to the emergency room. She's she's actually pregnant and she had a kidney stone. Oh wow. So I went over in the middle of the night and then I was the one that was in charge for the next two and a half days, which, you know, was quite a learning curve. <laughs> but I, I thought, you know, this is what it was like when my kids were five, seven and nine. Yeah. You know, and. Um, uh, but when when they came home, those dear children, you know, they they really. uh really needed their parents. There was no way that, you know, grandmama could be the substitute and, and they just fell on, uh, you know, their parents 
into their fel parents' arms, and and they just they they're almost like I can't let you out of my sight. Right. Now, so so there's you know incredibly precious things that have with happen with parenting, but <laughs> you can't be too selective because there's just you got to do the wash, you know. You you have to get milk, you know. You have yeah. to. The, and then there's the dog, you know, and right. the cat and. So uh, when I came, when I, when they came home from the hospital on Sunday afternoon and I came home, I sat in my chair for the entire rest of the day. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I could never do that, tur that turkey, what'd you say? Turkish get up. Get up? Yeah. Turkish get up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start know, calling it a turkey though. On my knees, you know, I can't, I have to get on my knees to get up. Right. My 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 granddaughter said, Grandma, Mom, why don't you just stand up? <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Actually, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. So anyway, that was to the childlikeness. But you were starting to ask me, did I did I answer it? Did yeah? Did I mean, I, I just kind of asking about like how you, like your relationship with yourself, like knowing yourself compared to like when you had a kid, like your first kid compared to mm -hmm. like understanding something more about yourself with a grandchild? Well, I would say that all that has more to do with aging. Yeah. It just, uh, there's no other way to get to a, uh, uh, well, no, I'm, I can't say it that way, but for me, mm -hmm. uh, a, a truthful grasp of myself um, has taken aging and actually a, a, a bit of a, um, I think, you know, when I look at my life, there were several situations that uh, did not allow for uh, me to grow in a, in a truthful way in truth with regard to myself, like it, it, they were impediments, you know, mm. um, and you, in that way, you know, you can look at parenting as it's like, look, this is not about you. <laughs> you know, you just, again, you just have to, you have to get through this. Yeah. And so I, and I've always felt, I, I know I'm excitable, but the other thing I am is, is um, solitary. You know, I, it seems like I have always had to think and I've only ever been in touch with myself. I feel like, when I've had that time. And, and so I highly commend retirement because it, it allows uh, the solitude um, for, for the contemplative. Right. And, fe and feel, it's only when I'm with myself alone that I feel like I'm in touch, in touch with myself. Yeah. You know, and, but that's, you know, I, t I think, you know, I don't know if you know about the Enneagram, but right. <laughs> I'm a, little a four. Bit. A little bit. <laughs> So, so, you know, I know different people are, are wired in different ways, but for me, it, 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 I've always needed some sol solitude. So, uh, to, f to be able to feel myself, I guess. Mm. Does the Enneagram so, really describe you? Like, does it nail you? Yes. I think it doesn't know what to do with me, <laughs> okay. but, but it, uh, it, yes, it nailed me. Wow. And, and, and really helped me to see myself in a, in ways that I had not seen before. And I do believe, you know, uh, that they're the, the point that I've, I've read is, look, this is the beginning <laughs> of your spiritual work, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, your job is not to be your number particularly, but to rise above its, its, right. uh, <laughs> so, um, but I was not, I was misnaming the sins. And, and, and so, uh, when I got to see them truthfully, I was, I was able to see, okay, this is the healthy me and this is the not so, so healthy okay. me. And, and I, I gotta, you know, there's times that I'm disoriented, you know, misoriented and I need to, to draw myself back to a, a true orientation and, and that kind of thing. I, um, I've, I've just kind of needed the, the kind of the solitude for that. Is, so, is there an authority figure that you kind of sought out with the Enneagram? Well, my second daughter said, you need to read this book and listen to these podcasts. So I did what she said. <laughs> what was the book? 
Um, well, um, there's something called the Enneagram Institute online. Yeah. Uh, it used to be that if you went to that website, it, the first thing it would say is take the test, but you're not supposed to take a test. You're supposed to read because the test diagnoses behavior and the Enneagram is about motivation. Okay. So, so you want to read. Everybody can do the same thing, but for these different motivations. Uh, but, uh, you know, I read that and that was connected to this book by um, the it's actually I, I work a lot from it in doorway to artistry. Yeah, it's uh, when I'm talking about presence in, in the hearth chapter. Mm -hmm. um, I have, it's heavy with quotes from the wisdom of the Enneagram, which mm -hmm. is the, the book. Okay. And it, it's not stuff about the Enneagram. It's that at the beginning of that book, it says, look, the Enneagram is where you begin. <laughs> to to figure out uh you know what your spiritual uh practice needs to be or whatever it says i can't remember now but yeah. so it was really that all that he says about present they say about presence that i i built into doorway to artistry so the co composing yourself to be present and so i think maybe that's what one of the things that's that goes on with me is um you know, right now I'm so connected to you. I'm not thinking about, I'm, I'm not attuned to my own presence. And, and so I feel like presence is possible for me when I'm, I'm solitary. Okay. Is, the, is there a, a certain practice that kind of gets you into that while you're by yourself? Or you're no, just, just, I mean, so much of my solitude has been enforced. <laughs> you know, it's like, it just... You know, the children grow up and go away. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. You know, I've got, you know, my morning practices and, and all of that, but it's it's, it's also just the, the, the time to compose myself. Time. My sister was um, 12 years older than me, and, and uh, one of her uh, telling stories about me was... Um, apparently there was a time when uh, we were all supposed to be getting ready for church and, and she looked into my room and I was sitting on my unmade bed. And she said, don't you think you need to make your bed? <laughs> and I said, I have more important things to think about. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> you know, that that's very interesting to me because you know, reading reading the book and, and hearing you talk about when you were 13 and kind of like, how do I trust my own knowledge of, of me, of you, of, of knowing itself? That's yeah. uh, Did you have any friends that you could talk to about that at 13? Well, no, but actually, you know, I I, um, I have to grab a picture and show you. Excuse yeah. me. Um, uh, the role of friends in knowing, right? So um, this is my dear colleague, Bob Frazier. Let's see, which do I, way do I go to is. show it to you? There, I see it. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's on the eve of COVID and the eve of my retirement. But uh, Bob was my colleague, my philosophy colleague. We were the philosophy program at uh, Geneva College together. And um, I talk about Bob all the time with, with you know, my students or whatever, because uh, whatever the regard is that you get, in, in the rapturous welcome of the mother. Friends, certain friends continue that. So there's certain friends you need to attend to so you can see them seeing you. Mm. And so uh, Bob has always seen me with utter regard and delight and confidence. And I learned actually to be myself by becoming the, the self that Bob saw. Right. And he became the authoritative guide. Wow. Really? So one of the reasons I've written so darn many books is because Bob said, well, you could do this and you could do this and this is what you need to do next. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, that's a real you friend. Know, so, uh, it is. I mean, I, I, that's, that's what friends do. And so in that respect, even though I, I like the solitude, it, it's these certain operative faces, mm. you know, I, I mean, I, I haven't, I don't get to have the, the, the daily connected 
darkness with him now that I, not only did I retire, but I moved away an hour downstream on the Ohio River. So, and he's an incredibly busy man. But actually, you know, when I would bring this up in class with my students, what would happen is they'd all start to grin because he saw everybody else too. And he especially saw athletes. Mm. So female athletes, male athletes. So Bob and I would be walking across campus and uh, we'd pass a student. They'd say, hi, Dr. Meek. Hi, Dr. Frazier. <laughs> <laughs> wow. As he saw people, what that's what he did. He, 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 yes, yes. We, we should all aspire to see people. And yeah. that's my job as a grandmother is to see with rapture my grandchildren. Wow. I think it's the job of parents too. Yeah, it's but just <laughs> all this other stuff they have to do. But this is the second <laughs> chance at parenting. Get, well, it's right? just different. Yes. Yeah, I different. mean, it, a grandparent has a different role. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess you, I mean, you would have a lot to tell the parenting self, your your parenting self from when you were just a parent, right? From this perspective now? I really do feel like it's a different role. I'm not sure I I, I could. What would I say to myself? Right. You know, I see, I see some stuff I didn't get right, but I I feel like I I was well intentioned. You know, right. I really, yeah. I really all along did feel like my job was to be my parent, my children's cheerleader. Yeah. Like I needed to attend to them. I needed to listen to them. I needed to help them grow into being who they were. And I needed to cheer. It was my, I was entitled. They were entitled. If I couldn't cheer for my own children and that's, and actually I, it was my first daughter that taught me that. Mm. So I, you know, when I was a first, at first a mother, I thought, oh, I'm not going to be one of those mothers that's rhapsodic about their, their child. Well, I got over that real fast. Yeah. <laughs> because if, if, if mom can't do it, who can, Yeah. you know, who else in life is going to be just 100% in their corner? Yeah. To use a boxing metaphor. Hey, hey there you go. Learn how to fight. <laughs> um, that that's that's very true. I had uh, I had parents who uh, loved me deeply, um, and uh, now that I'm th I'll be thirty six this year. Uh, you know, the more adults I meet as an adult, right? I'm not a kid anymore, right? So when you meet kids, they're not they don't even know why they act a certain way, right? But now that you know. People are getting older. They're kind of understanding themselves. And they just tell me the relationships with their parents. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, so you don't know that relationship that I know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I, I just continually feel so lucky and blessed. Yeah. Um, when, I mean, it's sad that they have that. But like every time I hear it, I'm, I'm more encouraged by what I have. Um, mm hmm and that's a Beautiful. it's a hard thing to do it seems for you know all of us as you know just to be that cheerleader for our kid um yeah it's a hard thing i guess and they need to see our face of of delight and regard yeah you know um yeah you talk about that in the so, book so yeah and then this book i'm writing now um it might be called frontline philosophy mothers and friends Okay. Because what I'm, I'm just picking up on what Baltasar says of, uh, you know, the, the child awakens to consciousness in the, in the loving gaze of the mother. Mm. Right. And, and, and that gives us philosophically that forms us philosophically. So wow. it gives us our sense of our existence. It gives us our sense of, of that, you know, it enacts that dramatic encounter that is the paradigm of good knowing yeah. and the liveliness of reality, you know, that that reality is not a bunch of dead objects. No. No. So, so uh, and then, you know, Baltazar says in that passage, uh, the promise of the mother's smile is only fulfilled in Christianity. Mm. 
you know, and you think about this, any adult, let's say all the 36 year olds in the world, they wouldn't be sentient and, and functioning if, there, if it hadn't been for the rapturous gaze of the mother, which means every single human person who has ever lived to adulthood saw the loving gaze of the mother whose promise is only fulfilled in Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's powerful. It's powerful. I, um, I, uh, for some reason, I always struggled connecting with my mom, not because of anything that she did. I think it was more of a me thing. Um, and, uh, and maybe it was more of a, like a, I'm a guy thing. Um, I'm not well, sure. Well, maybe you keep telling her she's got to exercise her piriformis. That's probably it. <laughs> I came out the womb saying that mom now. All right. Now that I'm here, I got to keep reminding you, uh, but uh, but my relationship with her has improved over the past couple of years. Um, Beautiful. I think now because I'm more aware of of who I am and why yeah. I act a certain way, and you know, yeah. and I'm like, oh, you did all that. If I was trying to do that right now, I would lose my mind. You know, like yeah, just kind no. of relating as I age to to her. But I had this. Um, I had this experience. Um, I did psychedelic therapy. I don't know if you ever heard of this. Oh. Yeah, I'm that vintage, you know. What's that? <laughs> I'm 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 the age. <laughs> I remember the hippie era. <laughs> right, right. And um, uh, there was a moment where I found myself in the womb of my mom. And I ah. heard her, and I heard her singing to me. Ah! And the uh. the love that I felt coming from her was um. I'd never felt Beautiful. that. Yeah, and, lovely. Uh, I connected with my mom on a on a deeper level than I thought was possible. Oh, um, that's fantastic. And, uh, so there's, yeah, I, I don't know even why I just said that, but, uh, there's, there's something to, you know, the love of a mother. Yeah. But, uh, well, and you know, back to philosophy, if the paradigm of our involvement with the real is the, is intimate communion with the mother, how far out to sea is modernity? So far. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, a that, lot of, <clears throat> go ahead. Know, it's not just about knowing God. It's about being a good scientist or a great business person or a good golfer. Yeah. 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 And the relationships that you build within those, uh, pursuits, hmm. you know, um, you know, I, as a coach, you know, I, I, Back to back to when my that John, my buddy, forced me to be a coach. Even though my dad was my coach my whole life, I love him, mm. but he was very hard on me. Um, oh. Yeah. So I didn't want to I didn't want to recreate that. And then every dads other, have a way. Yeah, dads will do that. Yeah. And uh and then I had other coaches in high school and college that were really hard. And I was like, I don't want to be that. I didn't know a better version. So I was like, yeah. I'm just not going to be a coach. Right. Yeah. And yeah, then I met that? my buddy, John, and I'm like, oh, yeah. you're doing it right. I agree with everything that you're doing with these guys. Can mm -hmm. I join? Can I, can I do this with <laughs> you? And then being <laughs> and, a coach was fine. <laughs> yeah. How about that? Yeah. Well, that's a bit of a, uh, I, it, back to what you said about words. Uh, th what your buddy did was shape you by this pronouncement. Mm. You know, you're a coach. <laughs> and you said, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, know, you were birthed as a coach in that 
verbal pronouncement. It's a let there be, right. which is what how God brings reality to be, is he says, let there be. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that so cool? Yeah, it's 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 amazing that he saw me as that when I wasn't allowing myself. Yeah. To see that. Well, Oh, you might one of my funniest Bob Fraser stories. It's a little crass. I I'm like sorry. it. Sorry. Let's go. Early on, uh, uh, we're walking across campus, and I, 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 I think I was, uh, I was in. Uh, I've always been tempted to feel that I'm not a scholar mm -hmm. <laughs> because my vision of a scholar is, um, you know, somebody who loves research in a library. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I'd rather have a conversation, you know, or, or, or whatever. But, but uh, he said, Esther, <laughs> he said, do you know the difference between boy dogs and girl dogs? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, my hackles went up at this point. It's like, what is coming here? I did not know him very well. And I said, well, I have a dog and he's demistered. <laughs> <You> <laughs> And uh, he said, well, um, boy dogs piss against their own tree, but girl dogs protect their territory. And then he went on to say, the entire academic process in America is male. And I said, I'm a scholar. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. He said, you know, uh, uh, you think you don't have uh, any, you know, you think your bad, your memory is bad, but I, I name some person and you come up with all this stuff that you know about that person, you know, it's just like, it's all kind of connected. Right. And I, that makes me think of another uh, erudite former student of mine, um, Drew Johnson, who, who said, who says, when I'm with you, it it's like your your way of thinking is is like running circles around me. Mm. So you know, there, there's back to your point about different ways of going at things. But um, why did I tell you that story? Oh, well, he na he named Bob named uh, a different vision of scholarship for right. me. Yeah. And, and it was incredibly freeing because it restored me to be to myself. Here's another thing that he did for me. And I, I wrote about this. It's in a, a blog out there somewhere. But he said, you know, back to up and the dog. He said, you know, when we walk across campus and you say, oh, look at that flower or, or da, 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 da. He said, well, well, you are it, what you're doing is delighting mm -hmm. in that. And. Um, that makes God especially happy because that's his art and you're delighting in it. And that's your job is, is to delight in, in seeing, you're seeing things truly in your delight. Yeah. And, and, and it's also your, um, your spiritual service. So, you know, that again, I, again, I thought I was silly and childlike, mm. but because Bob named it that way, you know, then it became, this is my job for God. I, I mean, so when I'm saying, when I'm jumping up and down over the sunset or this bunch of flowers or this seashell or, or whatever, I'm at my spiritual post. I am standing at my spiritual post. And my job is to keep my eyes open to bear witness. Mm. So um, every day when I would, where I used to live, I crossed the Ohio River on this bridge um to go up to geneva and the ohio river is just beautiful and i said to myself you know people are going to find me dead like one of those witches you know on, on the, on the uh, uh bridge one of these days because i felt like i was obligated to god when i crossed over to look that way and then look that way just to see the new thing that god was doing at on the river yeah today so, but all of that came about because Bob named the delight that I was, I can't help myself, but an act. That's awesome. I, I, I see my mom in that description, you know, in her garden. She's always talking about, do you see this flower? And she's explaining it with just so much delight. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, 
just the way that well, you then, see things is so fascinating. As, as she sees you, you know, or as, you know, as you see yourself being seen either in your, well, certainly in your mother and father's eyes, but also like, especially your coach yeah. guy, you know, you, it's, it's, that's when, you know, they become, uh, they're at their post delighting in you and you can start to see yourself in the, in the loving gaze of, of the other. And we need them through our lives. We do. We do. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously we need to be able to, to find that post for ourselves and I identify it like Bob identified it for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How long, how, at what age were you when he said that? Do you remember? I got hired at Geneva when I was 50. Okay. That, and that was my first full-time job. Wow. <laughs> so I had all this adjunctive, yeah. but I'd never been kind of an honest academic. It really made it kind of an honest woman of me as far as being an, an academic. So, wow. and I need the credentials just like I need gray hair because I'm so childlike that, uh, you know, it's hard to take me seriously, but if I've got a PhD in philosophy and I'm an emeritus professor from Geneva College, you know, then, then oh, there's a gravitas to her. Right, <laughs> Even though yeah. the behavior kind of belies that. <laughs> well, that's what gravitated me, John and I towards you was the joy that you had. Um, Good. You know, credentials, obviously great. But everything you were saying and the passion that you were saying it with is, um, yeah, you don't see that much, you know, with nope. with, uh, with philosophy. Somebody introduced me recently as the merriest philosopher they knew. <laughs> wow, that's a great title. <laughs> Philosophers probably philosopher. didn't even think that what that could be a thing. I know when when joy is the heart of reality. I mean, it just yeah. <sighs> right. We we witnessed that in uh, in the sport of wrestling. Wrestling coaches, obviously, a lot of sports are like this. But the coach takes themselves so seriously. Like if yeah. you, if you watch the NFL, all those football coaches are just taking themselves so seriously, yelling at the players. You don't ever see them laughing. You know, you don't ever see them like. Well, I'm a fan of Mike Tomlin. <laughs> okay. It was kind of like a pearl of a coach. So. Right. Pittsburgh. Right? Pearl of a man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, but in wrestling that there's not that much joy in the coaching process, you know, How about that? there's like this, uh, I don't know, this, there's this, uh, innate feeling as a coach sometimes that you feel like you can do it for your athlete and the meaner you get, or the louder you yell, the more they're yeah. going to be able to do what you want them to do. And, yeah. uh, I think dads wrestle with that too. What's that? Dads. Yeah. Wrestle, kind of wrestle with that. Yeah, for sure. Do do you did you ever wrestle with that as a mother? Maybe in a different way. I I I for me, I I felt that it was right and good that um That the that my children respect the office of mother. Mm -hmm. Um. So I I guess it perhaps made me high handed in certain ways, but I I, I don't know I I myself didn't have a restrictive mother at all. Um, she was really a good mother. Um, and, and I, I don't, I wasn't a restrictive kind of tell my, my children what they ought to do. I, I think I'm more inclined to trust them that, that they needed to be, uh, to, uh, in the sense of taking seriously who they were, who they were and who they were coming to be. Mm. So, and guard that, you know, and I also always have felt that about my students. I, I would be um, kind of jealous to protect them from uh, 
forces or others that would uh, impede them being the best people and students that they could be. And that includes the rest of the class. So I, uh, you know, insisted on certain boundaries in the classroom right. um, just out of um, kind of protection for the flourishing of, of my students. Wow. You know, that kind of thing. And I think I, I might have done the same thing with my children. I I felt that um, I think I always monitored who was in charge as far as uh, with, re, you know, them with respect to the world around them. So it seemed to me that if my children were influencers, that was good. Mm -hmm. And but if they were passively being influenced you know if if the kind of the flow of the tide were the other direction i would have a concern with that but i i felt that um my job was to um help them uh be their own agents right in their learning uh and in their involvement with the world so 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 that they could interact without being mowed down and i i feel like that that worked I, you know i was so intrigued with the middle school years where i i just watched them each one of them find their way to how they connected with others and with the world and they all do it differently but they all were on the uh that you know they had the upper hand in that and um i'm quite a fan of of uh, marching band okay <laughs> and jack and, and, you know, we did a whole lot of, of that sort of a mus musical involvement, you know, yeah. vicariously on my part. I was always a band mom, but, but uh, you know, I, I just saw kind of just healthy, healthy involvements grow. And that's the kind of thing I, I kind of kept tabs on, mm. but, but it wasn't kind of a tell them what to do. Yeah. Sort of. Thing. Just it was more a kind of a managing of the boundaries mm -hmm. for the, their flourishing, maybe. Interesting. Uh, and since you're a philosopher, uh, do they hate all the questions that you asked them? I don't think I, I. I've always had a hard time talking about philosophy with anybody because. Oh. <laughs> and uh, um. For one thing, I'm way more interested in uh, listening to what other people have to say. Mm. Um, but uh, and and I'm not a confrontational person. Yeah. Um, and but you know, I hope I've always modeled kind of a, a a listening. So I don't I don't think I talked about them philosophically. I think I I live philosophically because I can't help it. Right. But I you know when I was writing Longing to Know, which really was kind of the formative book, I remember Star who now lives down there, you know, and she would have been about fifteen at that point. No, no, no. She would have this. She would have been off to her first semester of college, so maybe more like eighteen. But she just kind of marched into my room and she said to. Him, so aren't you kind of writing about um, um, people who um, think faith is over here and reason is over here? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, that's everybody at college. Everybody at college thinks faith is over here and reason is over here. So if, if, she, if you fix that, that's like the most important thing. And if you do, you'll be famous like Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> That's funny. And then she walked out of the room. Wow. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of this pronouncement. But, you know, my my uh, other two daughters, actually, you know, so Star's got a master's in theology and married a philosopher. Oh, wow. And who teaches here. And his last name is Plato. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Plato. But, That's great. But the other two daughters are engineers. Okay. So, and mm. Stacy, my second born is not only queen of the highways in, in uh, St. Louis, but she's she's uh, a, 
an art collaboration with her husband, Evan Smith, and then she's the church organist, and then she's my social media helper. <laughs> okay. But I, you know, I, I, she's ha heard me present, but, but it's not like she's, um, we don't ha we don't particularly have philosophical discussions though to me listening to Evan and Stacy talk about artistry and and her her incredible leadership with Modot I mean again I am just in the fan mode when it comes to all all my children I think I think that she's amazing mm. and uh, she would be a little older than you my my kids are you're on the young end of my three but but uh you know i i'm so often listening and and to, and actually if i had any artist in mind when i wrote doorway to artistry it would have been evan okay my son law because i feel like he's continually doing philosophy he just it's and that's i at one point in the book i say something it's almost like artistry is liquid philosophy well that's evan to me and he's a painter he, he is a sculptor Sculptor. Sir, I think it would be called. Um, it's very conceptual. You ought to look at his his work. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's out there. Let me tell you. I mean, uh, his current show at the Sheldon is is of slightly broken uh, pl playground equipment. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> you know, he's that he's that kind. Wow. Uh, he's incredibly. He's incredibly talented, but what I've I've just I've always wanted to listen to him because he's he's groping, he's groping for reality. Yeah, you know, and uh, Stacy um, uh, uh, collaborates with him often in that even though she's a civil engineer, you know, she she's often the one that's working out the wiring right. to to make whatever happen happen you know it involves lighting or a picture or you know light from within or or something like that so but you know they they are he he and they both see themselves as a collaborative process too that's very interesting so, so i've had evan in mind but I, I the other thing is i have a family full of artists you know i i'm the only one who uh isn't singing or at well i i like choral ensemble and i'm in a choir but the 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 prodigious uh pianists in my life and the organists uh and the choir directors and then the ministers you know ev on sunday morning everybody in my family i think <laughs> is at the front of the church except me <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying they're yeah. either at the keyboard or behind the pulpit Wow. But I, you know, my sister was professional as a pianist when I was born. And then her three, she's got three grandsons that are, they, they really are prodigies. Wow. And, and so I, you know, compose myself to listen to them and cheer them on just like I did. You know, I learned that. And my, you know, my aunt Lorraine, who gave me all the blue and white china, was this diva. She was a soprano diva mm. and um, famous. <laughs> and, and you know, uh, so root, rooting, I guess, and listening has been something that I've done a lot of in, in my life. And so, yeah, I, especially when my children are performing musically, I want to be in the front row. Right. Now, with your daughter who uh, is uh, has got her doctorate in theology, right? Masters. Yeah, and uh, masters in theology, and uh, your daughters who are engineers. Ha what has been? Uh, what have you witnessed between the two types of minds, like relating to each well, other? Well, for a while, you know, when when we were more often together is that if star and i started having some sort of thoughtful conversation the other two would look at each other and say so what is the square root of pi <laughs> <Right. laughs> i want to be in the, in the middle of that conversation yeah but you know listening to you talk about yourself i am reminded uh, uh that they 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 all use both sides of their brain somehow, you know? So mm -hmm. 
here's Stacy, an en- a highway engineer, you know, and she's an art collaboration with her husband, right? And a and an organist, and helps me with social media. Well, she, that's her age. I mean, she's at the age where she knows what to do with Instagram, which, right? Um, yeah. You know, it's still beating me a bit. But and then Stephanie is um, uh, really what she is is uh, she turned into a high school math teacher, but then she turned into a mom, and so she's a uh, you know, a proficient, uh, home there, both of all my grandchildren are homeschooled. Oh, wow. And uh, are involved in, you know, I don't know if you've heard of classic conversations or Charlotte Mason, or, I mean, there's just incredible, incredible stuff going on with all of my, my grandchildren. So that's really, and Steph, you know, Steph, my third daughter, her moment of discovery was actually, um, happened would would have happened in the marching band room when all she was the trombone section leader and all the bad boys in her section were flunking trigonometry and they found out that she would help them nice and and she's good wow. she's good <laughs> that's awesome so so that really was kind of the beginning of her calling wow now when it when it comes to you seeking out uh, being a professor, when did you think, oh, I could, I could do that. Like, that's what I should do. Because like with, well, with philosophy, right, there's not much that you can do and get paid for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what like, deters it's about people. Life. Yeah, that's right. Um, but, um, growing up as a good little Christian girl, um, I needed to be asking what the Lord's will for my life was. Well, I, I didn't know myself well. And my, my well-intentioned parents said simply and truthfully, whatever the Lord wants you to do, that's what you should do. But they didn't, they didn't say, oh, you're a coach Mm -hmm. or whatever. Well, if I was philosophical, nobody recognized it. (laughs) Mm. I, I mean, and I, I, I didn't get any kind of, there wasn't anybody in my life that said there's philosophy and you're philosophy. Nobody, there was no one. So uh, the moment of insight for me came when um, I I had started college and um, connected with a guy named David True. He was from California (laughs) who uh, was a student of this teacher, Mr. Greer, and was ecstatically, uh, sharing all the great stuff he was learning from Mr. Greer and philosophy. Okay. And I, I recognized it. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, it, it, it took me 12 hours to change my life, um, to, to transfer, to, to, uh, change my major and to head to go study with this guy that I'd never met. Wow. And that was the moment that, that defined my life. So, you know, then, you know, I got to Cedarville College where Mr. Greer taught, uh, took every class he ever taught, <laughs> Great, became his grader. He built a desk in, into his office for me, and I graded all his papers, including my own. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, the tests, not the papers, but uh, it was in that context that I, I thought, well, if I have any baby sense of calling, it would be to help other people get their feet wet in philosophy because philosophy had revitalized my faith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like I knew the answers, but I didn't know what the questions were, you know? And, and so that then I, it's not like I had a feeling because I didn't trust my body. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And if I had, my body was actually miswired because I I was living out acedia saying no when I should have been saying yes. So that was part of, part of the dialogue or, you know, what was going the dynamic that was going on with my life. But, but I had this sense of moral obligation right. that overruled. So even if my body was saying no, I had to, you know, I had to study philosophy because it, it was right to do. I yeah. had to, you know, I was sure I was not smart enough. So wow. I've, I've never done philosophy so much because I thought, oh, I can do this. I've never thought that. I've never thought that. 
But so then I thought if I, if I was going to be faithful to that calling, I had to get a PhD right. because, you know, nobody gets hired to teach philosophy unless they have a PhD. Yeah. So that set my course. Yeah. But then, you know, it was the way things developed as far as my philosophizing goes that turned into eventually into the book longing to know and that actually got me hired mm. so so i was kind of an author of philosophy before i was a, a proper academic and Gen, you know the job at geneva was the job i had trained for but quite honestly it was so difficult to uh, actually get hired as an academic in philosophy really? that and the fact that i never you know, had a full time job before when I when they offered me the job, I was the most surprised person. I I had no, I couldn't take it in that they actually hired me. Wow. So it, it still seems utterly miraculous to me. Wow. That's a great story. I love that. But you were just pursuing that. What did you say that that moral obligation? Yeah. Do you think that was uh... the f philosophical matters were the most important? You know, my thirteen-year-old question was, "How do I know there's a world outside my mind?" And that's a big problem. <laughs> yeah, but why did that matter so much to you? Because some people dismiss that and like, <laughs> oh, I know. Well, right? I, you know, I, I didn't tell anybody. I, I was sure it was either sin or I was crazy. Yeah, but it didn't go away. It did not go away. So that's, and honestly, it, that defines my life. And my life is now a quest of at least 50 years, starting at 13, that's 57 years, right? Yeah. So um, it just, it, it, the whole thing just seemed to matter. And no, I, I don't know. It does. You're right. It doesn't seem to matter. But I, you know, so I spend my life beginning with people that are not as attuned as you are, as far as things philosophical, and they don't even uh, uh, recognize, let alone allow that they're philosophical. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm, I'm always starting kind of downstream <laughs> having to fight up upstream or, or or something yeah which means i don't expect to sell a lot of books <laughs> <laughs> uh that that's pretty funny but like your uh yeah that's that's so fascinating to me because like i was always that way i i found philosophy when i was younger i was uh i loved proverbs that's my yeah. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes is all I read. Um, my hmm. brother was more of Psalms. He loved Psalms. Yeah. Um, but I was just, I was like, when I when I read in Proverbs that uh, knowledge, uh, wisdom, and understanding were more precious than, you know, gold and gems, I was like, hold on, what? This guy is saying that this is more important than riches? What? what there's something here. I got to figure this out. And, uh, and then I found, uh, I found Bruce Lee when I was in eighth grade. Bruce Lee. Do you remember him? So he was a, a Chinese Kung actor. Fu. Yeah. Kung a, Fu. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, he had his, uh, yeah, nobody knew about the martial arts. What's that? Before that, before him, nobody knew about the martial arts, I think. Yes, absolutely. And uh, he actually brought Chinese gung fu or kung fu to America, to the West. And back then, it was, you know, you weren't allowed to do that. You could not teach uh, non-Chinese people kung fu. But when he came to America, he was like, no, I'm going to teach every everybody learn needs to learn how to defend themselves. And he would, you know, he would have to fight other dojos that were like, hey, you can't teach white people here, like in San Francisco and in Seattle. And he was like, well, we'll just fight for it. Like, you make me stop. <laughs> Literally, that's what it was. That's how it was back in the 60s um, mm -hmm. when he was coming through. 
But he had his journals posthumously uh, published. And mm. it, his perspective of mixed martial arts was very philosophical. Mm-hmm. And I was wrestling, and I found his writing, and I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you could approach your combat sport from this wisdom, from these wisdom teachings, and like this philosophical perspective. And so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, this is, this is a whole new thing for me. And so I started to look at my wrestling through the pr- kind of philosophical lens that he was looking through uh, to see combat and striking and kickboxing and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. And I just fell in love with it. I was like, there is something so vital uh, here. I'm not sure what it is, but I feel it and I connect yeah. with it. And um, that's yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like uh, been a pursuit of mine ever since. Um, I, did, I did have a student whose covenant epistemology project had to do with um, some kind of martial art thing, and, and it had eight, eight different stages around it. I can't remember now what it was called, but he connected those to all of the features of covenant epistemology. So. Oh, wow. That's awesome. But unlike you, when I talk about acedia being a refusal to consent to being, that was me. Mm. So I I had to wrestle with that no. That that I had learned to to um, live. You know, so it sounds to me more that you were attuned to your body and you could treat your feeling with integrity. But I w- I had learned an override. I learned an override, an, and an override uh, of what? Whatever my body might have been feeling, because I discounted it. I, you know, as a good little Christian, oh. uh, you can't trust your feelings, right? And and then you know, I had all this self doubt, which you know is a, a form of you know, I can't do this, I can't do this, mm-hmm. and you know, a moment came for me when. You know, I I figured I couldn't ever say I was a I wanted to be an author because I didn't have anything to say. <laughs> I thought that when when I was a child I wouldn't I couldn't even admit that that's what I wanted to be. But uh, somebody asked me to uh, speak to their their uh, some group at their church, and and I it was when I had said no. I can still see that that young pastor's retreating back, walking away from me. And I said, I have sinned. And dear Lord, I've been saying I can't do something. And it's 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 like I'm saying you can't do it. Mm. And uh, I please forgive me. Wow. And if you give me another chance, I will learn to say, I will say yes, even though my body is screaming no. So I got through a lot of stuff there for a while in my middle ages by overriding the no with a yes until my body came around to live out the yes. Wow. Did you, uh, did you ever see your, your daughters uh, kind of hit that wall, so to speak, of not believing in themselves? or No. <laughs> they seem to be, you know, just brimming with self-confidence i you know honestly really they i just i don't think they ever went through that well i mean that's obviously you know you've got to be accredited to that somehow right well may it be (laughs) but i you know they just no I, i i well you know my approach was you know, and there's all kinds of philosophies about this, but I, I really am an opponent of uh, early childhood education. And I did, I, I, uh, I start, I taught them all school at home for first grade. And, and um, I was reading the work of, um, I can't remember his name now, but uh, the, the thesis was um, uh, start kids at school later rather than earlier because uh, then they're more uh, able to be their own agents yeah. in the learning, if, kind of like what I already said to you. And that's so that's what I did. So I sent them to school 
later, like they were older. And they and I always sent them with a book and I and I said, look, your teacher is not in charge of your education. You are. <laughs> wow. And so if if uh, if the class gets dull, get out your book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and don't blame it on the teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you have a bad teacher, you're the one that's the agent in, in your education. And so that's why, you know, that idea of agency. Uh, I, I wanted to. I wanted to observe that that was going on. I didn't want them ever to be in the kind of passive recipient sort of position. And to me, it did seem to me there's, there's, um, I, I just, I really don't believe in early childhood education. I do, I do understand our need in our economy right? Yeah. for uh, care for small children. Uh, I, I understand that and I, I'm all compassion for that. Yeah. Um, but, and for me, you know, I, I, I love the idea of homeschooling. I'm glad that my grandchildren are homeschooled, but I also, uh, I couldn't do that, <laughs> you know, you know, for all the reasons you know about me already, but, right. but, um, uh, and I also wanted others to teach them who were passionate about what they were. So then what I did, and I, I always, I have been a believer in public schools just because it's free, but also because it's full of devoted teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we, in, I invented this every year. We had a thank you tea for our teachers. Okay. And and we, we you know, my little girl, the idea was they were all going to make some you know, plate of cookies, you know, or something. And then we were going to invite our particular teachers that we had had that year mm -hmm. home for this tea just to say thank you. I mean, yeah. there was no program to say thank you. Well, we did that every year. Wow. And those teachers were all in our home. They met each other in right. our home because by that point, you know, we were in a massive school system in St. Louis. The high school teachers didn't know the grade school teachers, you know, da, da, da. and, uh, you know, they were so gratified. They were so gratified. And then they poured themselves even more in into my my children. But you know, I, I honestly gotta cry, but I think of the faces of of those dear teachers who invested in in my daughters. And, you know, <laughs> the band the middle school band director, you know, said to me once, you know, well, the meek tea is the highest spot in my social calendar, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, I just, um, that, that to me seemed to be the way that I, I wanted to go to yeah. accredit the teachers that were investing, you know, the gifted teacher spent one spring break on the beach reading math books for my cerebral third born, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to do with her. Right. You know, that's devotion. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, when did you send them to school? Middle school? No. Oh, no. They all went to first grade and actually the third one went to kindergarten because she was so bored. Okay. Gotcha. So, and, and then the, the kindergarten teachers were like, why didn't you send the others? You know, it's like, <laughs> finally. Yeah. <laughs> finally, you let me have your child. You know? <laughs> By that time, we were all all close friends, but no, but but they were a little older, yeah. And and I had personally taught them all to read and write and do math. Oh, okay. And I, you know, I value that they had that individual, you know, because I, you can get lost not knowing how to read if oh, you're yeah. in a class of however. Yeah. But I saw it happen for you know, I saw it happen. I saw it happen because I was overseeing it at mm -hmm. that point. Right. So that meant I didn't have to worry about the teachers succeeding at the kind of those basic things because they were already done. Right. And then your daughters are homeschooling. Yeah. What what so made them they make that decision? Approach to public school as I did, but well. I think uh, I 
I would say uh, my daughter who lives here, we are in a vibrant, passionately Catholic community. And there's 5 million homeschoolers doing 5 mi million cool things. There, wow. it, it's unbelievable the liveliness in this area wow. um, around the children. Um, and I would, I would, I'm not as cl close with Stephanie, um, but I would say that probably grew out of her own personal expertise. I mean, you know, math teaching math is her love, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and and she's a very um, methodical research sort of a person. All that that I'm not, you know, and. Um, I just think it's kind of her expert approach yeah. to teaching children that that uh, just made that a, a natural, a natural thing to do. It makes sense. My my uh, my girlfriend and I uh, we we talk about that because L.A. public schools, e, kind of rough. Well, I was there too. Now that see this, my story was I was scared. I yeah. was really scared. Yeah, uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, I went ahead and then I just remember the first ever time I went up and visited the school mm. after my first daughter was there. And there were all these straight lines of children going places and it was all orderly and it was fun and it was playful. And I met these teachers who cared for my children Yeah, and relaxed. And, and I realized I had been dealing with a kind of a, uh, I just thought of, public school is the lion's den. Yeah. So I did, I did change my tune on yeah. that. Yeah. In humility. Right. Yeah. And yeah, that was a long time ago. Right? right. Yeah. So. Yeah. The public school system out here in LA is, uh, it seems like it's getting a little worse. Um, it's not, it's not like, uh, where I grew up in North Carolina. That's a little different, but, uh, you know, the other option out here is just so expensive. You know, the private school system well, out here. Public school. But then, you know, when I met these teachers, mm -hmm. you know, I just, um, they were, they were for my children. That's awesome. So, I mean, there were some duds, Yeah. but they, they, they were teachers that were just laboring and the other thing is i always felt about the public school that it was the heart of the community mm -hmm. so you know if you wanted to be where the action is yeah in town you wanted to be at the public school that's that's how it seemed yeah it seemed to me. so i you know i i i do confess that that was not my starting whatever yeah and you know it wasn't their job to teach my kids about the Lord. That was ours. Right. That Absolutely. Me, you know, and I, I, w I was ensuring that. Yeah. And then it seemed to me, and this is uh, kind of doctrinally uh, a, a matter, I, I had come into um, a reformational worldview mm -hmm. that, um, you know, all of life is religious and God has for us to, to, uh, you know, carry out our work because it's good, right. <laughs> you know, and, and so it's a kind of a common grace approach. Yeah. And and so um, and that the I write about this in Loving to Know. You know, people that are good teachers, you, you know, you don't go to a barber cuz they're a Christian. Right. You go to a barber cuz they're good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At <Absolutely>. barbering. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and that was my approach, you know. So so um uh, uh, that's what you go to school for is, is to, to get people to train you in, in those particular things that, and they can do it if they're pagans. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, it, it, like, do you remember the old film Amadeus about Mozart? Oh, so good. Yeah. I mean, he was just a jerk. Yeah. And that's what Salieri couldn't get over in the right. film is, you know, Salieri loved God. Right. But everybody sings Ave Verum Corpus, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's like we sing Mozart, you know, even though exactly. even though he was a jerk. So, so um, that you know, I I I felt I I grew in that mm -hmm. um, 
in in a kind of a Calvinian uh, approach to stuff. Yeah, that that uh, meant that yeah, it's good to you know get this this particular particular literature teacher right. to teach my kids or this chemist or yeah I don't know their faces are just appearing before me as I as I reminisce with you thank you for it I haven't thought about all this for a long time uh, yeah I had I had great teachers in public school and uh, you know we always talk about like all the lessons we learned growing up in public school um, from being around, around real people uh, as which is something that you might not be around in a private school, you know. <laughs> um, my buddies were, you know, living in trailer parks, uh, not too close from the school. You know, I was I lived out in the woods. You know, so it's like, um, those relationships and you know and learning how to fight in public school. Like I know fighting is something that you don't do in school anymore, but when I was growing up, that's what fights broke out. And you learned, you know, it's not like something I wanted, but, you know, it, there's a, you know, I, I learned um, how to protect myself and, and guys will fight each other and then be like, oh, okay, cool. That was a good fight. All right. And we're okay. friends now. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, sure my wife is is uh, lacking because I didn't have a son. What's but that? I'm glad to have a I said, I'm sure my life is lacking because I didn't have a son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My mom was always so scared of us when we were wrestling. She was or scared for us. She's like, Do you yeah. have to wrestle? Like it looks like you're gonna break every bone in your body. <laughs> Please yep, stop. Yep, yep. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, I, I I gotta do this. For some reason, I feel like I gotta throw somebody else while they're trying to throw me on my head, you know? <laughs> well, Esther, Aww. I've I've enjoyed this conversation so much. Um Oh, thank you. I have two, Cody, and I just I just wish you could be my trainer. <laughs> thank you, Cody. Absolutely. It's so good to have this conversation with you. I just well, I'm very glad. And I, I just love your your uh you know your felt body film philosophy integration. <laughs> it's, it's just awesome. So I, I love it. Thanks. Well, thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people uh will be and can be helped from you know doorway to artistry oh that's wonderful yeah. who listens to these communion marathons of yours <laughs> um not as many people as i hope but uh i have a feeling of indeterminate future manifestations oh, bless you <laughs> <laughs> magic word <laughs> so eventually a lot more people and then they'll find this one. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I'm going to let you go. I know you are busy, so thank, thank you, you again. I really appreciate this. Go oh, in peace to love and serve the Lord. That's right. Thank you. <laughs>